Okay. Thank you all for being here tonight. You just, uh, you all look great as usual. And uh, nobody looks tired, and that's a good sign because we won't have a lot of yawns taking place tonight. But uh, let me uh, assure you uh, that you'll have, a, you'll have a great time. And if you don't, uh, don't tell us about it because we're going to do this again next year. So, <laughs> so I, would, uh, I would like to uh, introduce somebody here who I met, I suppose, uh, probably six or seven months ago when she first came to the college. And she called and she said, do you have time to visit? And well, I always have time to visit. That's just the way I am. And sometimes my wife will say, where have you been? And I say, I'm going down to City Hall to sign a couple documents. And, and that was two hours ago. You know, but it's a, so you know where I've been. Anyway, we are very delighted and, and very proud to have a new president here. And I, I've had the honor of knowing <clears throat> three, yeah, two full-time and, and a part-time, and, and, and now uh, this president. And <clears throat> they've all been great. Uh, I can't tell you how much, especially the last three, have uh, impressed me. So with that, I would like to introduce you to the president of Century College, Angelia Melander, who will have a few things to say to you. Uh, thank you for your applause and welcome. And I would like to say good evening to everyone and welcome you to Century College. Welcome all the past recipients, the Hill family members, any representatives, Matamidi White Bear and Century College Educational Foundations and any elected officials, friends, family, and community members. Century is pleased to host this event this year on our beautiful campus in this picturesque library <laughs> under the wonderful watching eyes of Stan Hill. How can it get any better than that? So talking about having fun, how can we not? Talk about not going to sleep, how could you not? Any sleepers will be escorted out. <laughs> no, we're not going to do that. But I am new to this event, but I am not new to celebratory anniversary of Century College's 50 years. Please give us a hand. We have been transforming lives of students in this community, and I know as community residents, you are pleased and glad we're here. It makes our community richer and more vibrant when education and educating future citizens of this country in our own community that is White Bear and Matamidi, all in the same package and how great can we be? Sometimes we do get confused as to whether we're in Washington County or Ramsey <laughs> County, but um, we figure it out and we make it work every day. So it is my pleasure and honor to serve as the president of Century College. I am entering my full year as of June 30th, and I'm still standing, so that's a good thing. <laughs> For this evening, I look forward to hearing the history from the mayor and Kevin Donovan, who I've had the pleasure of working with in my time here, and being here to witness our current year recipient and to receive this prestigious community service award. It is an honor and a pleasure again, and thank you for being at Century, and thank you for being at this wonderful event this evening. Now we'll see how, uh, how accurately we recorded who came. <clears throat> I did see uh, uh, Diana, George's, uh, late uh, George Hill's wife here. Did, uh, did Mary get here? Okay, and how about your sister, did she get here? You did, thank you very much. I'm delighted to see you, as usual. 
And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to read through a list of uh, dignitaries here. And if you're here, would you please stand up and remain standing if you can until I finish talking. <clears throat> Bill Rust, are you here? Ted Blazing? Ellen Bruner? Yes, right here. Thanks, Ellie. Uh, Lori Alness? Carol McFarlane, who I know is here. Jackie Reese? Keith Warner is not here, I know that, but he was a great uh, person to have on this list. Uh, David Gerenbeck, who I also know is here. David, good to see you too tonight. Uh, Dale Johnson, yep, that's you're, you prepared perfectly. Thank you very much. And uh, Greg Bartz, who is one of the more recent members. We had the pleasure to, uh, along with Eunice, to interview all of these people. Uh, Bill Fussard, who is probably a guy known by most people in Minneapolis and St. Paul as well as White Bear. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and the late George Hill, I'm sure, who's not here. But thank you very much for being recipients of this award. <clears throat> so the best of my knowledge, that is all of the people that I think should be recognized. There's Rand a lot more dignitaries here. Well, they're all dignitaries in their own right. <laughs> I, I, I am until I get home. <laughs> when we used to have discussions with the neighbors and somebody would say, well, well, who's boss at your house? I'd say, well, my wife is boss at my house. But when I want to be honest, a boss, I go on a road for a week. <laughs> and that's pretty much how we spent a happy 45 years. <laughs> At this point, I would like to uh, introduce Kevin Donovan, who will amaze you with the facts about the Hill family. Kevin, I know you were here before. Well, I don't know about amazed, but uh, I'll do my best. I, I do want to call out uh, Angelia for, in one year, setting this campus on fire with goodness. I just am so impressed. And our first meeting was scheduled for one hour, and it went from 9 until 11.22, <laughs> causing me to miss a meeting. Uh, I just completely blew it off, didn't know what happened, and, and the person was very forgiving. But uh, just uh, just an absolute pleasure to have you at Century College, and it's absolutely a pleasure to have everybody here. Um, Anyway, uh, Kevin Donovan, I'm on the Matamidi School Board, and I'm also the Development Director for the Matamidi Area Education Foundation. I want to recognize a couple of my colleagues from Century College. We got Jill Greenhall. Jill, wave, stand. We have uh, Randy Johnson. Oh, he's way back there. Okay, so so uh, Jill and Randy are. Uh, run the Century College Foundation, do great work for students and 50 and 50, isn't that the slogan right now? Yes. Yeah. And then we also have the uh, White, Bear, uh, White Bear Lake uh, Area Foundation and we've got Don Hank, Don, in the back. And what's, uh, why I wanna call that out is 12 years ago, uh, we started this endeavor and the idea was to engage the two E12 districts and Century College, and we thought the best way to do that would be going through the Education Foundation. So for 12 years, the, your Education Foundations have been working together collaboratively for the best interests of our students, and um, it, it really is a thing of beauty. So uh, the way this happened, I mean, you, we've got the great Stan sitting in his famous green chair, but uh, it stands memorial service, uh, two superintendents who are not here, and a uh, college president who's not here also, so I can talk about them a little bit. Uh, we're at the memorial service in the back, and, and uh, you, know, you can just imagine three, three boys in the back, you know, not paying attention, but no, they were. And um, they, they had this idea of putting together this type of thing to an honor the work of Stan and Doris. And um, they thought this, this would be a good volunteer, you know, both of them, consummate volunteers in our community. How can we put something together to honor their legacy? And so this was born 12 years ago, and we've had 
all these amazing recipients have been honored. This uh, award is intended to um, honor that spirit of volunteerism. And we have, in our area, some of the highest voter turnout anywhere in the state and in the country. And along with that is the rate of volunteerism. It's exceedingly high here. And we are so blessed with people giving back to their communities in so many various ways. Um, thanks to this community, we have a vibrant art program. We have the White Person of the Arts. We have the Wildwood Artist Series that has amazing musicians come each year. And we have the brand new Hannaful Center, the Lakeshore Player Building on 61. I don't know if there's any other community in the metropolitan area that can boast that. If you haven't been to the Hannaful Center, I would encourage it. They're doing open houses. Along with that, we have a very robust program to help people that have needs, basic needs. So we have two great food shelves that are doing great work. The White Bear Area Food Shelf actually has a, sa a satellite food pantry right here because 50% of the students that go to Century College are Pell eligible and don't know where the next meal is going to come from. The other uh, fun thing is that in families where volunteerism is, is, is big on the priority list, it seems as if from parents to kids, this volunteerism strand stays strong. And so to this day, and I don't know, I haven't verified my facts, but I know there is at least one or two of the Hill Real Legacy that's doing tax returns for those in need. So thank you for that work. Oftentimes, the volunteers in our community are kind of the unsung heroes. Sports figures get awards. Politicians get more than they deserve. But our volunteers don't often get that. So tonight, we have a really special opportunity to recognize uh, a very long-standing volunteer in our committee. So, uh, in our community, so I want to turn this over to Tom Schneeweis. He is the nominator and the brother of this year's Legacy Award. So, Tom, without further ado, tell us about your brother. Thank you. Very much. Well, I didn't know he had this many friends. Who would have known? You know, I want to thank you all for coming out here. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm from way far away. I'm one of the foreigners. I'm out in Massachusetts. And so it's really an honor for me to be able to come out here and uh, say something nice about my brother. And it, one day, this is probably the most uncomfortable person in this room is probably Bob. <laughs> because he's got to sit here as some people say nice things about him. <laughs> okay. And I appreciate the fact that when he was doing the service, this was the last thing in his mind, that sitting under a, a family we grew up with <laughs> and the friends we made when we were kids here together, and sitting here and an award coming from Mr. Hill and his, and his wife. So the only person that's probably here that's more uncomfortable than Bob is me. <laughs> you know, I left 40, 50 years ago with the promise I wouldn't have to return. And now I'm coming here and really praising my, my brother. And the way that the nomination got started, I was asked quickly to start how the nomination was made, is that his daughter, Sarah, sent me a list way back years ago about things that her father did. I had no idea. We kept in contact, but I never had a chance really to sit down and look at it. It's in my grief, oh God almighty. OK, but I was a long way away, right? And I, so at least you know, with the family and everything else, there's a great opportunity. And I know that the Hills, knowing Bob and growing up, that it's something they would like also and kind of a, a chance to say thank you for all the good things that he did. With the full knowledge that if I was living out here, I would really feel uncomfortable because I would be second best. <laughs> and that was very easy being 1,500 miles away. So, this is, so if there's any person that feels more uncomfortable than Bob here today, it was the fact that I didn't think I'd have to be here and admit the fact that 
what a great job you did, not only in raising his family and everything else, but the service that he did for people inside the uh, community here. And then when he said that he had a chance to meet all of you, I realized that for the most part, you already know him. And that what you don't know is how he got in his blood, right, the things that really led to him being and believing that serving, serving in a community, right, as he has over the years in many ways, is part of what started it, right? So I thought in about the minute or 30 that I have here, I quickly kind of go through some of those things that got Bob started in the, the service gene, if that's the right word for it or not. Okay, well, first of all, he's my younger brother. And now I want to say, I only say that only because it, there's my old, myself and then an older brother, John, who, who's not here today. I know already because <laughs> that's what he tried to do because, in fact, my brother and I were dueling knives in the back kind of brothers. And so Bob had an opportunity to find out how not to act <laughs> and how to be successful, you could work with people rather than working against people, right? So I, in some ways, wanted to share this thing with Bob because I'm the counterexample. He saw how my brother and I acted, and he went 180 the other way. <laughs> so the number one thing in a service gene is you have to learn how to work with others, and I think that's one of the reasons he grew up with a real example of how not to work well with others. And so okay, he got this, this service gene. Um, the second thing is that he had an opportunity to go to Hill High School. My brother and I went to Hill High School, and Bob went there for a short time frame a very short time frame, because when he got to Hill High School, he realized that he couldn't change the impressions about him by myself and my brother had created. <laughs> and so he immediately knew that to try to change, to do the impossible was worthless. And so he learned that in his gene. And he went to Monomedi, where I'm sure he met many of you and became friends with many of you. And another thing as part of service is that you have to have friends. And so the very fact that he went to Hill High School, learned how basically to learn not to do the impossible, return to Monomedi to do friends, yourself, and that's an important part of the service component. It's always a very important part. The last little thing, and I had to write this down because I was going to forget about it immediately, is that uh, I didn't think about it until I saw this thing here. Uh, we, we've known the Hills for many years, and we're, we're part of the sailing community out here. And the one thing that Bob learned from working, being in sailing and having going by the, in fact, they just had a little out there, was that we were the worst of the sailing group. <laughs> and so we were part of the underdogs. So Bob has a true appreciation for, number one, how to work with others. Number two, knowing the art of the impossible. Knowing that friends are important to create service, right? And knowing how to support the, under, the underdog. And those are all things that he learned by growing up in Montemita. And I think that's an important part going forward to all of us because in reality, there are many other stories, we don't have the time for all of it here, but I think you appreciate and I certainly appreciate We've talked about it here. Uh, we grew up in Marshall, we were talking about the 50s here with dirt, dirt roads and all the wonderful little things here that growing up out here is something special and I'm sure you and your, you know, and your kids know it's something special. That there's a freedom and an honesty and a sharing that's kind of unique about here. But importantly, when we were growing up, our grandfather, our father, and all the people around us did something for people. And I think that very knowledge, I wasn't part of it, but we learned what's how service, I'm sure Bob learned how much service was important from all the people that he grew up with. And I'm sure that when he gets this, he has this award, he turned to me, this is my award, it's all of your awards. Because he's just taking this in honor of everything that all of you have done also. So I'm sure. He's not taking this award in his own words, but as representative for all the people in the community who do similar things. I, he wanted me to say thank you to all of you who have done that. Lastly, I pointed out to him that you did not give this to him out of charity. I pointed out the real reason that you gave him this particular award is selfishness. Because in truth, what happens is that despite everything that's good that he's done, by making this award, you're gonna make sure that he has to work harder in the future. <laughs> And I pointed out to all of them that I'm right there behind him all the way, as every brother would, <laughs> pushing him forward and making sure that uh, I get some of the limelight in the process there. So he hasn't heard this in 70 some, well, he's 65, and I knew, but that's okay, in a long time he's never heard, heard this. Um, and I mean this truthfully. Um, for all of you who remember your parents, nothing else out of this, your, our parents would have been proud. So they're looking down here today, everything you've done, 
I thank you very much. That's why I nominated him. It was an easy, it was an easy one. Uh, that was one of the easy things to do. So again, I know you'll see a lot more of him, unfortunately, and work with him. And I want to thank you for giving the opportunity here to nominate him and to uh, give you an idea of where all this started. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, you already know it's really hard for me to follow Tom. I never knew there was a Tom. <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, two years ago, I got this big brown envelope in the mail, and I opened it up, and it was all these wonderful things about Bob, and it was saying, Tom. I thought, well, where'd he sneak in from? You know, that's it. And now I find there's another one in hiding someplace. But, it's just been such a pleasure to know Bob and Jane and their family and, and now Tom, who I, I feel very close to because we can, we can stand here and laugh and talk about when the Bruning Farm was on top of the hill, which is right here where this building is today. A lot of, a lot of things have happened uh, over those years. So in order for Bob to be able to come up here and talk to you, I need to sit down. So how about if I do that, Bob, and you come up and tell us all a, a lot of things that we don't know. I'm kind of a chair person, so I asked him to bring a chair like this. You know, Mary and Jan, you know that look, don't you? I don't know how comfortable I am with him. <laughs> For most of it, I'll tell you more, because I, I knew their family very well. Um, they're right. Uh, this is, I'm probably not the most comfortable person up here. Um, have, being the focus of attention is not something I'm really very good at in that. But I think some of that comes from, and it's, I've heard it from a number of people, I guess I'll stand. Um, but it started with my granddaughter, who when my daughter said, your grandpa is going to get this award. And she said, what's it, who's it for? What's it for? And she told, told her and said, well, now why would they give him that? <laughs> so uh, that's funny, but I've heard it from other people. So I'm <laughs> beginning to wonder. But uh, in truth, it's a little uncomfortable because I look out here and the people here and other people that I know have done so much and they have given to the needy they have promoted programs that have helped tons of people they have coached they've given habitat for humanity I mean the people I look here and people I know that aren't here have done so much for me to sit here and get recognized for some this is quite honestly is a little embarrassing because I know how much other work people are doing so um, but what I can do is tell you a little bit about my experience of volunteer living in this community and what it kind of means and basically why people should be giving more and what they get out of it, at least what I got out of it. Um, before I get into that, I do want to mention that <clears throat> this is the Stan and Doris Hill Award. Now, growing up with them, I was aware that while Stan was out sailing or being in the judge's boat. Doris was back there keeping tabs of all of the, the uh, who was in first, second, third, and if you didn't race one or two races, you got a phone call from her to say, you're screwing everything up here because we're not getting the right kind of mix here, and if you don't race this, that goofs. So she was on top of it. <laughs> and then when he was like uh, treasurer, I think, of um, the Methodist Church, I think that's where the Unitarian Church is, um, I think Doris was the one doing the bookkeeping there, and Stan was the treasurer. So she was as much a part of it. And, and for me, the same is true for me with Jane. You know, we spent years going down to Dorothy Day on a weekly basis with our family. She's the one that set it up. And she was there with me in Boy Scouts, and when I was coaching basketball, she was there getting all of the other uh, parents together get the make sure that we got snacks and that the kids had all their stuff and when I was at a board meeting she was taking care of everybody so 
for me to get this recognition alone isn't really fair. She ought to be recognized uh, as much as me. So, so, okay. All right, now back to me. So anyway, um, if I start thinking about the community service and why I did it, I really should have been doing this to give back to this community. Um, but I didn't really know it. I, it didn't, wasn't conscious to me that I should be. My family, we have six generations of our family in this North St. Paul in Matamide. I think a lot of you know that. Um, <clears throat> my great-grandfather had a hardware store in North St. Paul. Then he ran the power plant to the streetcar that ran through Matamide that eventually the Piccadilly was on that spot. And my grandmother, I believe, was a... Uh, kindergarten teacher somewhere in the area. My grandfather was the, the uh, cashier and vice president, I think, at First Bank in St. Paul. And then my uncle and my mother went to White Bear School, this White Bear High School, because Matamidi wasn't open yet. Then my other uncle went to Matamidi. So all of this happened well before I was even born. And it made my family what it was, and I owed that to this community. Then I was young. And I start going through this, and we've got, um, I remember on Saturday mornings in the winter, there was basketball. And uh, Stu Brown, right? There's Dick. Yep, and this is Stu Brown, and my brother remembered, would open Wildwood School every Saturday morning in the winter, and we could play basketball. He never got paid for any of this, but he did it. And I loved baseball. So in the summers, I got taught baseball by Ray Rawlings. Now, you don't really know all the stories with turn up, but the story was that he played for the St. Louis Cardinals. And Judd, I don't know, you may know if this is true or not, but the, the Gas House Gang in the 32 is a very famous St. Louis Cardinals team. Now, he might have been up for a cup of coffee, as they say, where I don't know if he ever played, but he really knew baseball. And he taught us exceptionally well about rounding right before you hit the bags, you hit the inner side and the crows hop from outside. I mean, he really taught you how to play baseball. And he didn't get paid for any of this. And then there was Joe Cheetah. Now, Joe grew up on the other side of my grandparents, just up from now it's the Ramsey building. It's been Harvey's and a number of other things over the years. I swear, I think he was the umpire for every baseball game it seemed like I played in Matamidi. He never got paid. Don Hare. I think he coached St. Jude's baseball for years. He never got paid. So then I grew scouts. My father started scouts. And I remember that he, he would say, there was about a lot more kids than there were adults to take it. And he'd say, well, I guess half these kids are gonna have to go home because there aren't any volunteers. And finally some like, people showed up and they got enough to do that. But I think, uh, what that kind of tells me is that I, all this went on before me, and I had no idea who these people were. I really didn't. I knew they showed up. I knew, I don't know that I really knew what my dad did, to be honest. But I knew these people showed up and were there to help me. There was one, I had a friend named Rob Sheely, and Rob's dad, who was all thing Rob Sheely, and he ran the Sheely Cement Company, a big company in all this. Uh, actually, Joe, I think, was the uh, was Winter Carnival King uh, back in 1940 when my mother was queen and all this. We have this whole history. But Rob came. He was not a good baseball player, but he was a golfer. And he brought with him this bag of golf balls. And he thought, if these kids can hit this golf ball, that baseball is going to look like a watermelon. <laughs> well, that's probably true. What he didn't get was, when we hit it, it's like a freaking rocket. <laughs> and I think he just about decapitated himself. We were in the outfield. We were ducking if anybody hit one of these. So let's say he didn't bring that back again. But the fact of the matter is, here was a guy that showed up in his starched white shirt, the president of this, rolled it up. He was still in his suit pants, and he was there to help us. And that obviously still has an impact on me. I still remember that. So a lot of this is just kind of show up. That's, that's kind of what I grew up with. 
So then I, I, we got in, I got married. So this is my history. And we're in Highland Park, and Jane and I had our son Bob, and there was no Sunday school at the church we went to. Well, what do you do? Well, my experience was, well, start one. So we did, and we came out to Mount Amidai, and St. Jude's did not have one. So, well, I guess we start one here too. Okay, we did that, and I think because of my family history and that, I was on the parish council pretty young, and then there was uh, <clears throat> Gary Pelton. I don't know if anybody from White Bear here, but he was a long time you know, person from White Bear. He was president at the time, and St. Jude's really, we needed some money, as churches often do, and said, well, we need to start, what are we going to do to make money? Let's start a festival. Well, let's, yeah, let's do that. Some other people, we didn't know anything we were doing, but other people did, so we started a festival, and that's the Corn Fest that's still running today. So that goes on. So then my son played baseball, we got basketball, and there was really no organized basketball association, so Steve Walgamot, who many of you know, and Jim Walleen, who I have to say, that's such a loss to this community. He was such a wonderful man. Um, <clears throat> he and a few other people I can't quite remember, we started a basketball association. And because of that, all of a sudden now, my grandson, my granddaughter, and Steve Wolgamott's grandchildren, they're in this incredible basketball association that's doing a far better program than we started, but it's just developed. And it's just, well, it's not there. I guess we might as well just start it. So then came this is about the time that I started doing more stuff with Stan. And <clears throat> he really loved Century College here. Uh, obviously, knowing me, he knew a lot about me. So we were at, I had been at First Trust, and I had done some training at uh, St. Paul Foundation. And he said, you know, we really need to start a uh, planned giving program here. So he got me on the foundation board. This is in the late 80s. He said, let's start planned giving program. So we hired the first executive director Bobby, and I can't remember Bobby's last name, but and we started the planned giving program. Well, it wasn't long thereafter, maybe the next year or so, he was on the Children's Hospital Foundation Board, and they said, geez, we got to get some more money. Let's start a golf tournament. That was just the beginning of all the golf tournaments to raise money. So he knew I was a golfer, and he said, well, he's finance, he's a CPA, I'm going to get Bobby, he's going to help us start this golf tournament. So we started the golf tournament with this guy by the name of Hollis Kavner, and that is now the 3M Classic that is run every year, the Senior Classic that's grown into that. Thank God we had Hollis Kavner, because the rest of us, we were flying by the seat of our pants of how, you, <laughs> how do you get the controls over the cash and where all the people are going to be, and it was quite amazing. So we just started that, and then we do that. Next thing I know, Carol McFarland's calling me, and... <laughs> Stan has got the two of us into, he had a passion for uh, affordable housing. So we started this thing called, what a terrible name, NERT, North, Northeast Roundtable. And we got that, which then turned into MICA, or kind of enveloped with that, Metropolitan Interfaith Council Affordable Housing. So, okay, that's what we're doing. So that has been kind of my experience of how you get into this community service. You don't have to know anything. You just, <laughs> somebody gives you an idea, just go with it, you know? I think that's to a large extent. I, I don't say no very well, I just, yes. And um, it was really a great pleasure of mine to do this with Stan, although I did get back at him because we needed to do some reshuffling at Modern Media Education Foundation. He thought he was retired along with Ellie's husband, who was the first president. And I said, hey, come back here. You come back, and we kind of redid some stuff there. So um, I did get him back a little bit there. <clears throat> then, what else do I want to say? Oh, the thing is, after you do all this, here's the amazing thing about community service and why to do it. You never know how this comes back, but it does. So. It was in the early 2000s, and I was up at festival. You know, Kevin Donovan's here, but at his festival. And here was this woman walks up to me and goes, she goes, Mr. Schneeweiss, yeah. 
you uh, coached my son in baseball. Now this had to be in the mid 80s, so it's almost 20 years from then. And she goes, I just got to thank you. I said, my son had Tourette's syndrome and you played him like any other kid. He said, I can't begin to tell you the impact that that made on him and what that meant to his life. Oh. Uh, you know, maybe teachers get this fairly often, but in business, that's not the type of thing. And I tell you, it's worth more than any paycheck I've ever got in my life. And separate, and not to exclude business, I started my own investment program, business here in 1990. And it's tough enough to start a business anyway. But when you're trying to, to tell people, yeah, I can handle your money, I can do this, and I trust you, well, it's almost 30 years later, and it's grown in this. And I got to tell you, the beginning of it, I think, had as much to do because people knew who I was as a person as much as the amount, how I handled money. And I'll tell you, even today, through, though I might do it through websites or referrals or however business comes, you keep someone because of who you know they are as a person, not so much how much they know. And he's really smart anyway, so this really helps. So, but, <laughs> so it's, not, it's about relationships, it's about business, but I gotta say, if you're a young person coming in here, or you're an old person or whatever, and you want to get involved in a community. You say, what do I do here? Maybe I moved in. I've lived here my whole life. But how, how do I meet friends? I know young people that get married that come in here. How do I develop a new relationship? You know, start with getting involved in community service. You meet people that like to give to other people. You, have pe you meet people that are willing to give to you because you're a person that's willing to give. And it's just, if I was to say, where are you going to develop the kind of relationships you should want to develop, it's in community service. That's, what, that's been my experience, and I think that's what it is. Now, it isn't just relationships. I've always been a real strong believer in reading, because I think it expands your mind, and you become a more interesting person. Community service expands your humanity. It expands your your appreciation for other people, it expands your empathy for them, and it just makes you a far better person. There's a saying in prayer, you don't pray to change the world, you pray to change yourself to live in the world. When you do community service, I can't tell you whether that service is gonna change the world, but I can tell you it's gonna change you. I, I think that's, that is a basic of doing community service and probably one of the best things you'll ever get out of it. So, um, oh yeah, I was going to say that, well, these might be interesting stories and they might interest somebody or pique their interest and whatever. I'm not sure that that stories or things like that necessarily keep somebody's um, interest for a long period of time. How people do community service is by seeing somebody else in action and then mimicking them. So. If you want to impact this community, be a, be a Stan and Doris Hill. You know, be a Joe Cheetah. Be a Ray Rawlings. Be somebody that all of a sudden is out there doing something for all these kids. And the kids don't know who you are. They don't know if you're president. They don't know what you, they know you're there for them. And that, and I'm telling you, it's my belief, a lot of you that know me really well know, I think somebody by the time they're eight or nine has developed mostly who they are and they've developed their relationships and what they think about humanity. So I think getting out there, you're going to meet people that you're gonna love, they're gonna love you, you're gonna impact people just by being there. And I guess I said I'm gonna read something that the bottom line that impacted me back in the early 1990s, <clears throat> Uh, Anna Quinlan gave a talk. I think it was from her book, I think, Living Out Loud or something. And she was in Minneapolis. And she has a statement. She was talking to a woman. She was an extremely busy woman in New York City. And she, she had an incredibly busy life. But every week she brought her children to help feed the homeless and the poor. And that, she asked her, said, you know, 
when you're scheduled, how can you fa possibly find the time to do this every day? And the woman just looked, she took a moment, looked, looked at her kids, and she said, how could I not? How could I not? So that's about all I've got to say. In, in recognition, yeah. so you can hang this on the wall at the office or, or in the bathroom at home. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's good. Yeah. You think I'm there a lot? Well, I don't know, but years ago when I was on the road, I used to send postcards before I came. Yeah. And after 20 years, one of the guys I used to call and say, mm -hmm. you got any more of those postcards? Yeah. I said, yeah, I think I got two or three. Send me one. I got a little spot in my bathroom about that big. I just need another card to fill it up. <laughs> that was humility for me. Mary and Jan, I do want to point out, this is, this is pretty special to me also because I was very close to their family. And Rick was one of my best friends growing up. I spent an awful lot of hours at their house. I spent a lot of time with Stan after. So, um, separate from at the ward, it's, it's special to me and our family, given our relationship, um, to get this. So, thank you very much. Well, we've had a lot of fun, some of it at Bob's expense, some of it at his brother's expense, but uh, we, we all got to know the family, I did anyway, a little better than we knew them before. Can you imagine having two brothers hidden in the closet someplace and, and he never said a word to me, you know. I, every once in a while my wife and I get down on the beach and we're taking pictures of the sunset and who's over on the dock but Bob and Jane. and. Uh, uh, we always get an invitation to come over for a glass of wine, and uh, and I never turn Maybe that two. down. I, I never turn that down. Well, if I had two, you'd have to wheel me home. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's how. Yeah, Sweet's home. not around anymore. No, that's <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, boy, he he sure hit on a lot of old names that were just great. That Ray Rawlings they talked about he used to run the warming house in the winter time for all, and he'd be there. And I suppose I was maybe seven or eight. Ray is there. And he's tying all the skates for the little kids. And they'd go out and skate, and the skates would come untied, and Ray, and he's back. And he's calling, tying some more. And uh, he was, uh, yeah, one of, one of the characters that we had in town here, which were really good. Another one was Vince Kinnear, which is a close, close friend of Bob's at some time. I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, I, before we leave, I would just like to, uh, to introduce uh, the committee that uh, did all the work on this. And if they would uh, stand, or if they are standing, just raise their hand. Uh, David Bennett, uh, Kevin Donovan, Kate Christopher, Eunice Coate, Mary Coates, and Steve Ritt, and uh, me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming. We uh, hope to see you all next year. Thank you very much.